guys. Uh, I'm uh, Sean Richardson. This is Tom Anderson. We're going to be moderating this uh, group of uh, very talented, talented people. Um, we have a uh, podcast called the Art Up Boot Camp, uh, which uh, Clay has been on. And basically what we talk about on that podcast is how uh, creativity and business need to merge together. And this is, I think, a, a, a great place to have that conversation because I think, I think arts is one of the most overlooked platforms for careers. You know, when I was growing up, I didn't think I could be an artist. I didn't know that you could make a living as an artist. Uh, I had to learn that years down the road. So um, we're going to have a great conversation with these guys. Um, Tom, you want to say anything? You want to get... I'm happy to be here. Buddy. All right, cool, cool. <laughs> well, let's let's get kicked off. Um, uh, let's go in and uh, introduce everybody. Clay, have you already? Yeah, everybody know? Really. Go ahead, go ahead, Clay. Um, yeah. So the uh, uh man, my name's Clay Ashe. I'm a native of Baton Rouge. I'm um, I'm a filmmaker, puppet maker, puppeteer. Uh, yeah, that's good enough. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm very happy to be here. All right. My name is Daniel Strickland. I'm a freelance artist. Um, I'm born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I, am, I, I do comics and illustrations as well as storyboards for film. I'm Jillian Hall. I'm not from here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, but I'm proud to call Baton Rouge home now. Um, I work with Novak, which is the New Orleans Video Access Center. We're a media arts nonprofit. That we have an office here in Baton Rouge and have for several years. Um, we started in New Orleans in the 70s, so we have a long history of serving the film and creative digital media communities here in Louisiana. Um, I have a background in documentary filmmaking and youth media, and I too am happy to be here. And I'm Tom Anderson. I'm also co-founder with uh, Sean for Art Up Bootcamp, and where we talk about gig economies, trying to build your career, best self, trying to find a way to get your voice out there. Because I think a lot of times people just say, eh, it's just too big. And you know, you don't have to eat the elephant all at once. So it's all conversations about how to get from one place to the next place. And I still am gonna forgive Clay for what you almost said about actors and puppets. I'm just gonna leave <laughs> being an actor myself. I will not take that personally. I have been a puppet. I am a puppet. I own my inner puppet. Okay, that's all. That's all. And so I think I think we're a little early. I think we're still missing a few of the panels, but we'll go ahead and kind of get There's started. There's Jamie up there. He's hiding. Jamie's hiding. I love Jamie. Come on, Jamie right man. there. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go ahead and get started. So um, wh whenever the, the guys come in, we'll just get them to come on down, um, and we'll get them to re uh, introduce themselves and everything. But uh, I want to start off with um, how you guys got started in the industry. What, what was your kind of uh, pathway to... You standing on this stage right now. Take it some. Oh. I was going to let you start down no, no, no. there. I'll start. Oh, you go. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I initially wanted to be uh, an international diplomat. <laughs> Who doesn't? Yeah. Saving the world. Um, and quickly realized that that wasn't quite the best path for me. I needed to do something more creative. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and and there's tremendous power in you know creating art for, for the purpose of, peace. of peace and you know trying to understand other people and doing what we can to save our world. <laughs> um, so I uh, I went away to school and, and moved back to Austin, where I'm from, Austin, Texas, and um, was really interested in filmmaking, but didn't really know that I could make a career of that. Um, but in Austin, there are a lot of independent filmmakers, so I had some really great role models to look to that had actually managed to bridge their financial livelihood and their creative passions and to have those come together um, in a way that was viable for them. So I, I just started interning and trying to learn as much as possible about the industry to see if it was something that could be um, a path for me. Um, so I didn't know what I wanted to do in filmmaking. Uh, so I tried to learn as much as possible about everything. I kind of looked at it as my grad school. Um, I wasn't getting paid to work, but I wasn't having to pay to learn. <laughs> so for me, it was a good trade-off. Um, so I, I, um, there's a lot of music stuff in Austin, so I started filming and editing for friends' bands um, and then started working on more sets and just trying to get into as many different roles as I could. And ultimately, 
um, ended up really liking producing um, and documentaries in particular. So I've made my career primarily doing story producing type producing and then also like coordinating type producing for documentaries and have worked on a few different projects and then uh, moved to New Orleans and met Novak, our executive directors up here, uh, and then um, moved to Baton Rouge to take over our office here and to do some really awesome things here for Baton Rouge and for Louisiana. Well, um, I've been drawing my whole life. Uh, I've always been obsessed with art, and um, I always wanted to be a comic book artist. And so when I went to college, I, I decided to go to the Savannah College of Art and Design. This is not an advertisement, I, I swear. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah. And I studied what they... years were you there? I was uh, 2000, 2004. I'll be damned. Anyway, yeah, that was funny. But, but um, I, I studied sequential art, which is the academic term for visual storytelling in sequence, which relates to not only comics, but film, uh, co commercial work, uh, animation, stop motion, what have you. And uh, Savannah was one of the few schools that actually had a degree in that. So, uh, you know, it, it has its pros its con and cons because it's, uh, you know, it's a rare thing, but it's also like, okay, who's going to hire you now with that degree? But, but anyway, um, I, I, when I graduated, I became full time as a freelance artist and I did illustration work for companies, um, uh, graphic design, logo, mascot kind of things. And then I, I got dipped my toe into publication. And I did a graphic novel. I did uh, book covers and things like that. And only recently in the past few years, I've been able to get storyboarding work here and there, local productions, um, you know, s since that uh, tax incentive thing, which was a few years ago. And um, I, I found that, you know, it's, it's amazing, rewarding work just to be a part of that process and to, to have a credit at storyboard artist on IMDb. That's pretty dope, you know, <laughs> and, uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, that, that's my career. <laughs> Um. <laughs> All right, uh, let's do the quick version. I, um, but I, I also, I went to SCAD. I graduated uh, high school here, and I was going to get the hell out of town, and I was never coming back. This one horse town was going to eat my dust, and uh, when I was gone, they, they passed the tax incentives, and uh, all Welcome this back. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks. I love it here now. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> I was an angry 17-year-old who listened to too many Bruce Springsteen songs. I really <laughs> like it here. Um, but like, uh, I, uh, I went to Savannah College of Art and Design and, um, I studied film because I felt like it was all the arts and, uh, it gave me a chance to do the most different things. Of course, setting my life onto this path where I've not done the same thing for longer than two years at a time as an adult and it's exhausting, but, um, uh, but yeah, when we were going to graduate, all the, all the other film students knew I was from Louisiana and they were talking to me. They're like, so what, what do you know about Louisiana? Like, so I'm, I'm spotting in New Orleans. You'd suggest moving to, or I'm like, why is everybody moving to New Orleans? You know, like everybody's going to go back to my home state except for me and get a job. So I was like, well, I'm not going to get left out. And, uh, I came back and worked very steadily for, you know, 10, 15 years now. And it's getting close to 15. It's and, um, so, uh, but I, I started in this business as a production assistant uh, and it was a very sort of a very traditional start for a film student because you don't need your film degree. You can go major in literally anything. If you love film, you should major in film because they teach you about film, which is awesome. But nobody is going to ask you where you went to school. Nobody's going to ask you what you majored in. Nobody cares. Um, so, you know, you graduate and I was like, I'm ready. I have my degree. And they said, that's awesome. You're an intern. <laughs> and so I did my first movie in New Orleans as an internship, five weeks unpaid work. And then I came back to Baton Rouge and Jason Hewitt, who should be standing right here, but we're, we're early. He may not be late yet. I'm not throwing him under the bus. We're early. But Jason Hewitt, I walked into Jason Hewitt's office. He was one of the guys producing locally. And, uh, and I said, I don't know what to do. And he goes, well, you, you'd be a PA. And he hired me. The first two paid movies I did were low budget Jason Hewitt movies. 
and you start PAing. And if you're good at PAing, then they pressure you into ADing. Production assistant. Okay, I want to talk about ADs honestly now. <laughs> uh, but uh, production assistants run, they do everything. I mean, they're like glue that holds set together. Low level of credit, high level of stress, but you learn a lot and you learn what all the different departments do, which is awesome. Um, once you get really good at that, they're going to ask you to become a, an assistant director. <laughs> Unless you have like... Like, unless you're an, an adult child of an alcoholic and you have, like, high tolerance for stress and you deal with stress better, like, in a, in a like, in all the super heroic way, don't be an AD. <laughs> uh, they're a very special breed of people, but they're, they're high, their stress tolerance is unbelievable. So I actually backed off and I, I went into the sound department. I was a boom operator. I ran a Foley studio and an ADR studio. So I mean, I really, I was in, I was in production. I was in post-production. I really bounced around. And after 10 years, I realized I had not yet made a movie. I hadn't done anything. Oh, ADR is, uh, well, it doesn't really stand for our, our automatic dialogue replacement, but it doesn't actually stand for that. But it is, it's when the uh, actors replace their voices. There's uh it's, it's hard to get perfect sound on set, so they stand in front of the big screen and replace, as all of you who were on the Celtic tour know. Uh, and then, so anyway, after 10 years, I realized I, I had a film degree and I'd never made my own movie yet. So I started making shorts, I started making music videos, and um, I started making my own, my own projects. And at 30, I started making puppets, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> that, was, that was the short version. I love it. Well, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the education. For me, it was different. For me, I, I studied psychology and sociology at LSU, and then I dropped out and um, started doing grip work. I, I kind of skipped over PA in general, which I feel I was smart. very lucky. I don't know how I did that. <laughs> um, but grip work is basically working with lighting, and working my way from grip to um, camera assistant, to camera op, to DP, and then doing director and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but I remember on set one day, I was working, um, and, and the gaffer came over to me, and I was talking, I was talking to a lot of uh, cinematographers and directors that I knew, asking if I should go to film school. And they said, you see that, you see that PA over there? Not you, wasn't you. Uh, another PA. It might have been. He said, he said, you see this PA over there? He's been, he's been, uh, he went to the San Francisco Art Institute. He's got over a hundred grand in debt and he's been a PA for five years. Yep. And you're making more money in, the, you're making, you know, $600 a day. Jason, um, come here. Come here. Get over here. So, hey, so my, my path was a lot different than, I guess, your paths. You guys went to college. Um, graduated, got film degrees. What was your degree? Sequential art. Sequential, okay. And what, so completely, three completely different degrees, right? Sorry, sorry. And um, so, so I guess my question is, once you graduated and you started this career, what is your learning process to, to jump into the film industry and, and how to uh, get where you are now. So what, what th th was it? Was it a huge learning curve? Um, was it, um, were you just diving in face first? Uh, what was the, what was the process like? Did your education, cause mine didn't. Um, I, I was, I'm all self-taught in everything. Um, I didn't have the luxury of having someone really guide me. So I, I, it took me probably a lot longer to get where I am than, than a lot of people do get there. So what was your guys' experience learning that, that, that trade? <laughs> um, uh, film school teaches you um, how to be Quentin Tarantino and it doesn't teach you what a PA doesn't teach you how to roll a cable so just because Jason's here now I'm gonna because I talked nice about you earlier when you weren't here but but no I went to I went to SCAD and then I went to the Jason Hewitt school of pa -ing. you know like I walked into Jason's office and you gave me my first paid job yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if I should thank you or not. <laughs> uh, no, no, but I mean, so, so film school teaches you about film. Yeah. It teaches you a, 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 the art of film, which if you're a cinephile, you should love. That's a, it's awesome. But it, it's not the same thing as teaching you how to, how to work a job because your first job in the film industry is going to be a PA. And um, I didn't know what a PA was. Thanks.
I think to answer your question, my, my situation might have been a little bit different because I had so much, much experience with the comic and publishing end before I got into storyboarding. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I had already had my chops up in terms of drawing and being able to sketch quickly, but there was a lot of learning going into storyboarding. Uh, mainly, uh, the two, two main points. Well, one is that uh, you're in a situation where it's a team effort and you have to be able to communicate quickly and clearly and understand what the director wants, what the cinematographer wants, and translate that in a way that's going to keep everyone happy and it works out with your skill set. And uh, the, the second thing is that film filmmaking is a very organic, ever-changing process. You know, you, you, you may be rough drafting uh, a, a few pages of script and then the next day all that's changed. The, the writer doesn't like it or different ending, you, you know. And a lot of the more temperamental, fickle artists could uh, freak out over something like that, but you have to kind of brush it off your shoulder and yeah. keep things moving. I'm sorry, what was the original question? How do we, <laughs> how do we how, get into how, how did, once, once you got into the industry, because besides, besides Clay, we all kind of started in different areas. Once you got into the industry, how, how did you approach the learning process? Oh, I mean, I'm still learning. That's, yeah. what, I, that's what I like about it, is that yeah. there's always more to yeah, learn. that's a great answer. The technology is always changing. There's always new projects to collaborate on. Um, so I... That's I think that's why I'm drawn to this work is because it that's part of it is that there's always new things to learn. Um, I just I got lucky and I worked for free in some instances and tried to meet as many people as possible and learn as much as I could um, and make things when I could also just to have the own practical experience of that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's never ending. <laughs> Well, let's 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 introduce Jason. Jason, uh, why don't you tell us about yourself? Uh, tell us your story, and in in a hundred words or less. No, I'm kidding. Um, and uh, yeah, just give a little introduction. Sure. Hi everyone. My name is Jason Hewitt. Um, I'm originally from Southwest Louisiana. So uh, a guy like myself grew up dreaming about you know working in the film industry, but I never thought that I would have that opportunity. Um, that opportunity came in 2002 when the state first started talking about tax incentives. So that seems like a long time ago, but it, you know, 15 years ago, but for me, it was like, it's been like a blink of the eye. Um, I'm a film producer. Uh, I've directed some as well. And when I started, I knew absolutely nothing and is maybe arrogant or as dumb as I am, I thought that I could start as a producer. Why not? You know, and the irony is, is I think uh, film producers, the only entry level job left available in the film industry (laughs) at the time that I was producing films, you know, you know, if, if a PA showed up with a resume like mine, I wouldn't hire them as a PA, you know? Um, But no, what, what for me, what I did is, you know, I took other business experiences in life and translated them over into the film industry um, because it is very much manufacturing. You know, it's creative manufacturing. It's just in time manufacturing. So for me, I kind of applied those principles um, to get into the business. And it's been, you know, all the things that you've heard here is what I feel as well, even, you know, even 15 years into it is every project's new. There's always challenges. Um, there's never enough time. There's never enough money, um, no matter how big or small the project is. Um, but the one thing that I would say to, and I'll, I'll give it up, is is um, if you want to be in this business, you are your only impediment. Okay, I get lots of people that come to me and say, I want to be a director or I want to be a producer. And I ask them, okay, what did you direct? And, you know, it kind of stumps them. Right now, there's so much technology at everyone's fingertips, whether it's simply your iPhone or a camera or things like that. You've got to get out and and do it. Grab your friends and get out and do it. You'll learn so much from that. 
uh, film school, like Clay said, read the books. You can get every book at every film school. You can read it, you know. But going out and doing the, the work and seeing where it falls apart when you try to put it together is going to give you much more uh, learning experience. So. I would say, I would say I, there's a, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to ask you a question. <clears throat> I just want to add, when I, my very first PA job, which I'm still trying to master, okay, my first PA job was in 1973, and I was the assistant to the person who spread the peanut butter on the white bread <laughs> for a Jiffy peanut butter commercial. It was two-day shoot. There was a five-year-old kid who had to eat one bite of that and then perfect sandwich, spit it out. They give him another one. Oh my God. I'm still mastering the spreading of the peanut butter at home. Every time I make a peanut butter sandwich, I flash back on this. I go, damn it. But sometimes the career opens up for you and you realize there are some jobs you're just not cut out for. And that one was mine. So I'm spreading peanut butter. Uh, well, so here's my question, Jason. This is a cool, interesting question, I think. I mean, one of the interesting things to me about the film industry and something that Sean and I talk about on our podcast a lot, and I'm going to use a technical term here, so if you're young, you might want to cover your ears, but can you talk about um, the role of collaboration that is the film industry versus the people who are coming into the business for the first time who may not realize that it doesn't help them to be an asshole? You know, and I think that this is a really interesting cultural shift that you have people coming out of colleges thinking that they know stuff, right? And not knowing how to be part of it. That's, that's right. But I mean, that, that sort of, you know, what, what kind of a tempo, that personal professional tempo, that is something that makes a professional. Um, okay, so I try to have a strict no asshole policy. Excellent. Um, at, at this point in time in my career, I can turn those things down. But when you're starting, you can't. you got to take everything, right? So um, your first movie experience is going to be like drinking out of a fire hydrant, right? Because there's going to be, no matter what you know or you think you know, you're going to realize, oh, shit, I don't know anything. Um, so how do you overcome that? Well, you overcome that in this collaborative, you know, kind of effort. Because every single piece is important mm -hmm. okay so why is spreading peanut butter on a sandwich important is because it's a movie every right. single thing is important you know so three swirls not two it's it's all very important but um i would say is is in your first job um just have an open mind you know open your mind you don't know anything if you did you'd be running the show um and just listen you know now there's all you know we've all experienced politics on shows and issues and things like that, but in general, um, this is one of the last industries. If you listen, work hard, cover your ass, you can be successful at it. You know, um, and be easy to work with, and be and which is very important. Yeah, because most of your jobs are going to come from referrals. Right. Uh, you know, everybody's like, "How do I get in? How do I get in? How do I get in?" You know it. Most of your jobs is going to be someone's going to give you your shot, give you your chance, and then after that, that someone's going to get a phone call when you go to apply for your next job. And they go, how is Clay to work with? <laughs> <laughs> but really, that's, that's how this happens, even, yeah. even today. It, yeah. it, it's very much um, word of mouth, references, and things like that. It's a tribe. It's a, it, I call it the circus. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. For, for me, when you talked about a little bit, when someone comes to you and, and say they want to be a director and you say, well, what have you directed? Uh, for me, when I was starting out, um, it's, it's a very kind of, it, it, it was a very eye-opening eye moment when I realized this. 
I, I, I remember it very distinctly. It was me and my friend. I decided I want to be a filmmaker. I'm sitting in my apartment. I'm on my computer. And I uh, have an album B&H photo video. And I put a uh, Canon XL2 in the shopping cart. Um, all this gear added up to like 10 grand. And I put it on my credit card. And I was sweating. I was sweating when I hit the buy button. And, um, and then I got all the gear in. And then it literally sat in my apartment for two months, two, three months. I was so terrified to create anything. Cause in my head, I, I, I thought that I, the, the first thing I make, it has to be Tarantino esque, Martin Scorsese esque, um, you know, uh, Spielberg esque. It had to be amazing. And if it, if I didn't do it, I failed as a filmmaker. That was, that was in my head. And then, so what I did two, three months later, I, uh, I, I, um, entered 48 hour film festival. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but you basically have 48 hours to write, direct and produce a film. And, uh, so I did that and then it was horrible. It was, it was, it was, I tell everybody, yeah, I tell everyone when you make your first film, it's going to be complete garbage and, uh, it's not going to be good at all. And you're not going to want to show anybody, uh, your film. And then you're going to make the second one and it's going to be the exact same thing. And then you're going to make about 10 that are just garbage that you never want anyone to see. And then you're going to get good and you're going to get better. And, you're, and as long as you keep, are you saying that practice makes perfect? No, 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 not that. That's, that's ridiculous. That's no um, discipline practice, but, it's but better than perfect. yeah, yeah. So, so that was my biggest, that was my biggest struggle was to get over that hump of, of, of just doing it. Like you said, just getting out there and making something and getting over that fear. And once I did that, I, I started developing a style and I started, started having a voice. Um, so do that, do that. Uh, let's move on to the next question though. So the tax credits in Louisiana, they've kind of gone away. They were trying to get them back. Um, Be more specific than that. That's not, they didn't go away. In, fact, in some ways they got better. They, they got, got, they got, got, but they did, they, the, 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 the only thing that they have to fix is when, when, when you apply for the tax credits and when you get them, it's a technical issue. It's a technical it's issue. Bad yeah. legislation, badly yeah. written yeah. legislation. Yeah. The tax I, credits I don't, are still I there. Wanna, I don't want, yeah, I don't, I just don't want to perpetuate the rumor that the tax credits are, are gone. gone. They are not. No. It is, it's just badly written legislation that just needs to be pre-written yeah. that, but for small independent filmmakers, it got better. They yeah. lowered the entry yep. cap. So now instead of having to spend 300,000, it's 50,000. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 50. Yep. And, um, and there's all sorts of extra incentives. Uh, if your composer is a Louisiana resident, if your director is a really Louisiana resident, if your writer is a Louisiana yeah. resident. So for the ultra low budget, I just begged my rich aunts and uncles for a little bit of money. <laughs> I'm scraping by by the seat of my. It's like actually really good right yeah, now. Yeah. Um, but so yeah, yeah. I, I didn't want to well, interrupt. But. No, no. You you actually you actually kind of answered my question, oh. um, oh. which is good. Um, Sorry. A lot of people perceive that the film industry, which which a lot of the big films have gone away. They've gone to Georgia. Uh, the the series have gone to Georgia, um, but there's still a there's still a local group of filmmakers here. What are the opportunities? Because I think a lot of people think that they have to be in a big movie. They have to be on Warner Brothers. You used to have to go to California or New York or Chicago to work in the industry. The industry has completely changed with YouTube, with social media, with these with these outlets where you can produce, you can you can literally produce a film, edit it, and have it and have it available to millions of people to see. So in this in this um, environment that we have, where we have this infrastructure set up. Uh, we have these tax credits that are that are very very favorable to to indie filmmakers. What opportunities do uh, the filmmakers have in in uh, Louisiana to grow their audience, to grow their brand, to tell their story? Well, okay, hold on. Let, You've already let, answered. Give I, it a little, Michael. Let, let, just real quick, because the the, the I think the the a lesson that we can learn from Austin that speaks to that though is that it, Louisiana needs to grow. It's talent from within. Whether Hollywood's here or not, we can make movies. And like Austin's film industry survives on Rodriguez and Linkletter, who never left home. A little, yeah. you know, Peter Pan never left Neverland, and they have a whole film industry. Whether Hollywood wants to be there or not, they couldn't care less. I think we need to get more on board with that, where we're developing our own our own talent, um, so that Hollywood can come and go as they please. But we'll we'll keep making stuff. Good 
50. 50. 50,000. Okay, how do you go about applying for all of that? Where do you go as a, as a small filmmaker? Do you have 50,000? I will. I will. Oh. You just wait. Just wait, Henry. It's going to happen. Yeah, there's an, there's an application process through the state. You can apply online and meet with LED. LED? LED will take Yeah, for yeah. sure. They're they great about that. Chris Stelly is a good person to reach out to there. LouisianaEntertainment.gov. That's what LED is, Louisiana Entertainment Department. Yes. Just as a follow-up to that question, you still have to pay 10 grand to have your books audited before you get the tax credit even if your budget is 50000 I think it's five, se 7500 now. That was, and I mean, all of this, all of this could change because they're in session right now and there are some changes that are on the books for that they'll be looking at. But as it stands today, in this moment, that's how it is. Sure. Uh, do you have a question, sir? I got a question. You, you mentioned before that the new tax credits are great for, for lower budget films. Now, uh, I'm on the Metro Council here in Baton Rouge for this area and where Kelly Bowie Studios is. And I've been working with Patrick on that now. And met Jason. I said, uh, "What do we? Is HB two thirty five going to really help retain SB? SB two? Is that really going to help keep those permanent jobs? That when you've got somebody that's a creative director, something on a set where their paycheck on a movie alone is larger than the budgets of some of the films that you're talking about, how do we move?" to retain those jobs and build those businesses and post-production sort of businesses yeah. here. What do you, what, from, from your perspective in the industry, how do we do that? Uh, well, I, I, I can't claim to be too well-versed in all of this, but I do see that, um, that incentives work. I mean, we give incentives to other types of industry to come to Louisiana, even when there are the resources here that they need to come for anyway. Um, and so, <laughs> So I think that, that that's something to look at. So why not give, I mean, the, the incentives for films are great. I know that some of the concern is the temporary positions. Um, but the more that those, the more productions that are here, the more that becomes permanent, the more it becomes viable for people to freelance from one production to the next and to be able to cobble together full-time work. Um, but also to have incentives for a post house or for some other uh, full-time, you know, stable, a business, some part of the production economy to be here and to be based here locally, that would be incredible. I don't know what the status is with those plans currently, but I would like to see that happen. Do you all know more about that? I will say that like the film industry, I think, makes makes people nervous when you, know, you talk about offshore jobs. We all know how that job works. You go to a job, you're hired. Unless you do something incredibly stupid, you keep that job. Where... The film industry is very friendly to entrepreneurship, an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, so it, on, I think on the surface, it feels like it doesn't look like real jobs. I was unemployed once every three months. I mean, I wasn't collecting unemployment because they, they paid me very well, I, you know, whatever. But like it, I, when you graduate from college and you think you're going to have that one job interview at the nuclear plant where Homer Simpson worked and you're going to keep that job for the next 40 years of your life, one, it's a mythology. It, that, never, that never happens. Secondly, uh, even for people in, in the real world, you're going to change careers. Your life is going to change. Things are going to happen that you can't expect. The film industry is just like a hyperbolic version of that where you, I, you know, I, I, I worked very steadily for a decade and a half. My sister said, introduces me as, hey, this is my little brother. He's never had a real job. You know, like, it, <laughs> she did it lovingly. But, but I mean, no, but there's that perception where, like, this isn't a somehow, this somehow isn't steady work because the work in, the movie ends and therefore your work ends. But it, it, I think it's a lot steadier than people imagine as long as the productions are here and you don't have to have, you know, it, the film industry doesn't attract people who are going to work that one job for the rest of their lives. We're an agile, circusy bunch. I think one is um, to kind of further what you're talking about as far as permanent jobs and things like that. Um, one, on the production side, think of it more like construction. So no one ever talks about, oh, we've got, you know, 
carpenters out of work, um, things like that, you know? Um, so from the production standpoint, it is more, you kind of go from project to project and, and, you know, we've got some of the largest, uh, contractors in the state, you know, basically based here in Baton Rouge and, you know, no one talks about how, Oh, you know, we got a problem there. Um, I think to further answer your question, uh, and, and really revisit what Clay has said is, is that you got to grow from within. Um, the, the industry up until the tax incentive change has been kind of migratory because that's its nature. Um, but where we are now as a state is, is we've got a very solid workforce. Um, so, you know, why do you have to have incentives in the first place? Well, you know, that was an industry that didn't exist here. You want to create an industry for opportunity for, you know, young people, old people, all people. And you've got to do that by incentivizing it some way, shape, or form. Um, Originally, the incentive program was a 20-year plan. So we're not even through the 20-year plan because there's some very smart people that looked and said, okay, to build a permanent industry somewhere, you've got to make investments over a 20-year period. So I think we're in year 14, maybe 13 or 14. So we're not even quite to that, you know, to the end of what the original plan was. But um, it's all about workforce. Um, you know, Hector, who showed up late, um, if you know Hector and you've worked with him, everything's late. Just kidding. Um, but you know what you what you got to have is you got to have capable workforce, um, and then you can fight and claw for the non-production uh, jobs. So you, you know we do post-production here, and work the workforce is key, right? So we've we've got to have people that can do sound work. We've got to have people that can do visual effects work, uh, people that can color and things like that, and that's really kind of this next phase that was starting uh, in, in great earnest in the sense that from a production stand, you got to think about this from a business kind of standpoint. Somebody from California, right? So they're like, ah, I got to go to Louisiana, sleep in not my bed. I can't get my kids to school, right? So there's all of that anxiety and they don't know what they're doing, right? Well, that was like the first couple of years of the program where productions would come here and locals didn't know. Now, where we are is kind of this first phase is through from a production standpoint. Um, I've had the, you know, the, the opportunity to produce films in other places. And I can tell you that the level, the quality level of the work now here in Louisiana matches everywhere else. Okay, so we're just as good as everybody else. Um, now, the next step was the post production. So we kind of, you know, Across the barrier of industry professionals where, you know, you got to remember the movie business started in California many, many, many years ago. Now, it started here ah, 15 years ago. That's not a lot of time in the grand scheme of things, but we've made incredible strides. And this next piece is, is on the post-production side where companies or, or producers in California trust that the work will be done well and we'll pass quality control tests and we'll stand up in the market space. So, you know, I think the change in the program kind of slowed that, but I, like Clay, think the change in the program has only really empowered the local, you know, production companies or teams or producers or, or labor. We just need to do a little bit better, uh, and I'm the worst at this, but we need to do a little bit better organization to go, hey, you know, you guys, you guys have worked with stunt guys, right? You know, the, the old joke of like, how do you get 10 stunt guys on set? You invite one, right? <laughs> they, all, they all come. So we, um, we've got to take a different approach locally to go, okay, let's make sure that we keep everyone working uh, because there are peaks and valleys and stuff like that. We make sure we keep everyone working as much as we can, and that, that grows the industry uh, it meets what your goal is, is your goal is, is, you know, is to have longstanding businesses, constituents with longstanding empl employment, opportunities for young people. I think that, like, motion picture is probably one of the most powerful ways you can communicate a message. You know, I think 10 years ago, if you didn't have massive, massive budgets, 
you were severely limited on the quality of story that you could tell based off of the music that you had access to. That to me is what Music Bed changed, is it made the best artists in the world available to hundreds of thousands of filmmakers. And that hasn't really existed before. What we've done is created a platform to allow the creatives to be making the choice of who wins. I mean, that's been one of the most fulfilling things for us is watching hundreds of artists just almost begin to dream at another level. I'd just like to chime in on this. These are really great comments, and and I I don't we've never really talked too much about this, but I know you've talked extensively with Patrick about this. I would just add on that that I think that one of the problems here in Louisiana is that we're too dismissive of this entire industry as something as a soft industry, and I agree with Jason. Think of it more like construction. You finish that massive construction project. Now you're moving on to the next one, and they are millions of dollars to do them, and then you just have to build the next one. It doesn't mean that the entire group of the ecosystem that builds those needs to go away, or the incentives that had the people who built that building go away either. So I think that's one thing, is we have to stop culturally dismissing our own cultural heritage in the state. I don't know, because I would love to find out, if the music industry is to, is as if we're as dismissive of the music industry as we are of the performing arts and film. And we may be, I think, which is, to me, what some of the greatest advantages we have in the world, and we're not leveraging them. So I think that's one problem. I think another problem is basic math. When I read stuff in the paper, and I don't want to get too political here, it's not journalism. It's a person with an absolute point of view that absolutely thinks that the film industry should die and go away and it's cost us billions of dollars. We will never see it back. I tell you something. We had a Republican governor, Republican legislature. Georgia had a Republican governor and Republican legislature. They both hired two of the largest accounting firms in the world. In Georgia, they said, you know, if we invest a few more billion dollars, we can own this market. I think they said, then let's invest. And we said, everything was exactly the opposite. And I couldn't believe it. And I, I think that, I don't know if there's an opportunity to own and be the world capital of film anymore. I don't think that's really the goal. The goal is just to have an ecosystem of film here because there's so much talent. And breeding it in-house is absolutely the way to go and why I think the $50,000 thing needs to be fixed a little bit because a 7500 I'm an entrepreneur $7500 you know to cover my accounting before I've even begun my production is is a no go you know so I mean things like that have to be fixed well, let me say this I agree with you completely I I don't I realize the thing I just posted on Facebook and I did picture you guys earlier it's it's art it's film it's music but it's an industry, right. and it's an industry with secondary industries. That's right. I want to build this here so people have been, come here for a sense of permanency because they know that next large building for the construction example that you've got, the next, mm -hmm. <laughs> the next, the next big building is coming. You know it's coming. You're not worried about the next one coming. So instead of staying in a hotel, which is great, I mean. That to plug some talking points, but 17,500 one night stays in a hotel in a year on average in the film industry is a huge punch to the local economy here. But I'll say this, I'd rather have people feel confident to purchase a home because they work in the film industry. I want my brother to get a phone call in Vancouver that says Scanline is sending me to Baton Rouge because 
we're starting a post-production house there because they're doing that many films there. Yeah, one thing I think we've all kind of not really talked about, but in that vein, we've kind of been on the nose talking about construction using as an analogy, but we should have a contractor on this stage. We should have a chef on this stage. We should have um, uh, painters on this stage because they're just the biggest part of this economy uh, as, as the producers are, as the creatives are. And I think a lot of that gets overlooked a lot of the time. Um, it, you know, it, it really, the, the film industry really goes deeper than what a lot of people see. What, what people see is, is um, flashy productions and cool movies. But, you know, there are carpenters out there that are making their living building sets, building uh, infrastructure for these films. There, there, there are catering companies that feed these people. There are hotel industries that house them. Um, so it's, it goes a lot deeper than just what's on the surface. And I think a lot of that's overlooked sometimes. So that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and Sean, Tom. Yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you moderate up here. Sure. Because I've got the power. Of the mind. Got the power, baby. Yeah. So we have a new panelist here. It's Hector. He's a commercial dr dr drone pilot. And uh, let's get him introduced. How you doing? I'm Hector Toro. Um, I'm also a, an editor, a colorist, and a sound designer. And I just became a, a, a FAA licensed uh, drone pilot. And I'm uh, completely self-taught. I got into this game in, oh, wow. I was, I'm 40 now. I was about 20. And... Um, Started in music, and uh, eight months after I got into it, I was responsible for uh, for a platinum album here in Louisiana. And I'm from New York. How did that happen? I don't know, but it was uh, you know it was just something that I, I wanted to do. I stumbled upon it, and I, I wouldn't take no for an answer. And uh, I'm still here, <laughs> you know. And I, I transferred over into into the film industry uh, a number of years ago. Jason Hewitt gave me my, my first opportunity to uh, to mix a uh, a, a movie. And I uh, didn't have much time to do it. It was uh, one of those, you know, either sink or swim, and I'm here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I made it through it, and, uh, and I mean, I'm still here. I'm, I'm loving it, loving every minute of it. And now I have a question. Okay. <laughs> and this will be for, for really the three of you, Hector, Jason, and, uh, and our Clay. Y'all have all kind of alluded to the different departments on a set. And Clay, you talked about being a production assistant and, and you go department to department and kind of learn what each one does. Uh, could y'all elaborate a little bit on those departments and kind of what happens in, in those areas? I wish I had a call sheet on me, man. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's right. Um, um, yeah. All right, camera department uh, is, the, is the real obvious one. Uh, they everything that has to do with the camera, but there's you know there's a handful you know you have your camera operator, your assistant, your your second assistant who uh, you know does the slate. There's a camera loader. Back in the day when they were doing film, that was a really serious entry level job. But it was an entry level job. But if you took the film out of the camera wrong, it all went bad. So it was like the most intense entry level job ever <laughs> devised by whatever sadistic madman. <laughs> Said we should get a college kid to do that. <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, but yeah, the camera, the camera department, it's got a lot, a lot. Um, there's a, a pyramid to each of these departments. Sound, wardrobe. So. There's yeah. a, a film. A film set is like a small village. There's every type of job that you find in the real world on a film set. There's accountants. Yeah. There's artists of all. I always kinds, said it catering. was like a cafeteria of a high school. <laughs> like the sound department or the goth kids, they really just want to be ignored and to ignore you. Uh, they just want to be left alone. <laughs> but there's a there's an angry mixer um, who's like uh, got headphones on and Talk yells at people about dogs barking and stuff. And then there's a, a boom operator who has a microphone at the end of a stick. And then post sound is a whole nother. I mean, that's a universe in itself. Uh, art department is the art kids in high school. Uh, the kids that spend recess painting. Uh, but the art department, again, does a lot of different things. There's a set dresser whose job is to literally, if there's, you know, books and vases, you know, on a shelf, they make sure that they're, they're the same in every shot. And if somebody knocks over a glass in every shot that it's cleaned up, the new glass gets set there. I mean, you know, uh, that's just the on-set dresser, not to mention your, you know, production designers and art directors who are literally 
crafting everything that you see on camera. Yeah, um, no, I mean, one thing is too, and there's so many different departments, but I've always said that every single department is just as important as the next. Because, I mean, uh, a, a simple thing as in we're filming in the woods today, right? There's no stores nowhere around. And craft services simply mm. forgot to buy water. Simplest thing is water. Who's working? Anybody going to go to work in, in, in August in uh, Louisiana with no water? Everything goes. Everything goes away the entire day. I mean, everybody, everybody's job is so important. If it doesn't get done by one person, it's going to roll down the hill and somebody's going to have to do it. There's no shortcut in film. There's no, oh, we'll just leave, you know, just won't do it. It doesn't happen because all the way down the line, you got a QC and they're going to catch it. So somebody's going to have to do it. So every, if everybody does their job, this is like one, one train. One wheel falls off. Sorry, but uh, <laughs> this train is not going to get to its destination, you know. Um, so, yes. Yeah, I mean, I really enjoy working with the parking man. I've known it was I was working with security, but I wasn't sitting around watching everything. I had to go to the parking man who I was under. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. He's very determined to work with you. So the question they have asked us to repeat it is, is the location, yeah, so about the locations department, just ex elaborating on what that is. Was that your question? Oh, oh, oh yeah. So you're just sharing with us. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's a good department. So we have some local folks that do that. Um and they and they work a lot with uh local property owners and and people who are interested in having their properties be used in film and to be paid for the use of their property in film. We're going to move on um I got one more question. Then we're going to open up to uh, questions from you guys. Um, so, what advice? This is my, my. I love this question because I feel like I've. I've. It's 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 what inspired me when someone told me this. I that's what got me going. But to all those new filmmakers out there that are trying to get started, what advice do you give them? What what what, do you, what would you tell them to get them to make a film tomorrow? Well, is the. I guess for me would be, I guess the way I started, no is not in the vocabulary. Um, you can't, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, keep on, I mean, whatever your, your, your vision is, there's no wrong vision. I mean, look at all the movies that, that we watch that, you know, go global. I mean, it, it, there's no wrong way to do it. You just have to keep on, keep on doing it. If, if it's your dream, keep on going. Don't take no for an answer. Just industry another thing is filled with is sharks and haters and they're good they're all over the place so uh, if you see one and they're knocking you down push them to the side keep pushing because if if you don't they win you lose you know so um that's that's great advice um if you're not in the industry yet but you want to get into it what i would say is is go find a film set uh go find the guy that's talking the most that's usually the first ad um, introduce yourself and say, hi, my name is such and such. Um, I'll work for free and I'll do anything you ask. And believe it or not, that will probably get you. The next thing is get this person a radio and you'll probably, you know, go to work, um, and start gaining some experience. If you, uh, have aspirations of telling stories as a director or something like that, you know, right now you're your only impediment. Go out, find something beautiful, look for light, and film it. Tell a story. If you can't tell a story in 30 seconds, you can't tell a story in 90 minutes. So you might as well start practicing now because that's what it takes. Um, that was good. That was a good answer. You stole my answer. Um, <laughs> if. If you want to, if you want to be a, if you want to be a filmmaker, I say don't go be a lawyer or something like that because I don't need the competition. <laughs> um, but uh, but no, I I guess to, to piggyback on on what Jason said, the the there's um, especially with artists, there's a tremendous amount of self defeat, and we do we defeat ourselves in in a great number of ways, and one of the ways that we defeat ourselves is by by assuming we have to start by eating an elephant, 
Like, okay, the, the old saying, just in case you haven't heard it, is how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And the, the, the problem is, is that you don't start with the elephant. Um, even if you're going to eat it one bite at a time. Start with... You know, there's no the ant. Good. I was about to say I'm about like gonna pick some. I'm gonna pick some adorable animal, and this metaphor is just gonna get mean and like gross. All right. So yeah, you start with an ant. So so don't don't think like I, there was this idea when I got out of film school that like, I had to go make a feature film, and like now it's like I almost don't want to like make a feature film. Like I've been making music videos and commercials and short films, and I love it. I love telling short small stories. Um, I'd rather do a TV series now, you know, like it, you, and that's me after like 15 years of working on it. So I, you know, there is something to be said that like, no, you have an, you have an iPhone and you have two minutes, tell a story in two minutes with like two people sitting there talking to each other, practice your OTSs and your POVs and all those One letters they teach you over the so shoulder shot. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you, yeah, cause <laughs> if you can't, you know, do it, do it in two minutes, start there. Cause, um, uh, the best way f to fail is to be like, well, you know, I'm going to be like Kevin Smith and I'm going to put a whole movie on a credit card. And that never works. That worked for one guy one time. So start small. The key to any next-gen recoil rig is balance while keeping your rig short and light. Your eye, shoulder, and hand placement never change, so the key is to slide the camera as far back as needed to achieve the perfect balance. This forces your EVF and camera control forward, but our unique VCT base plate design gives you extra rod space, making it possible to mount accessories close to the camera body, allowing for a perfectly balanced recoil rig. The next-gen recoil's adjustability is great enough to balance any size camera with any size lens and any additional accessories, and its quick releaseability makes sense up and break down fast and effortless. Well, first of all, I want to say that this man here, Jason Hewitt, he got me my first credit, my, my first uh, job in film. So anybody up here <laughs> want, want, want some work, you know, talk, I, I, no, I'm just saying. But, but, um, but, but honestly, like, the, the, there's two different hats that you're wearing. You're the artist and you're the businessman. So, and a lot of times it's counterintuitive. When you're an artist, you want to get hermity and weird and go off in the corner and like make this crazy great thing. But you don't want to talk to anybody or tell anybody how good it is because that might like jinx it and then you're like egotistical and all this kind of stuff. So you, you want to be able to balance that where you can make great work or, or at least uh, you know, realistic work, let's say, not, not the elephant or, or whatever, but, but like, have that and be able to promote yourself and so so my suggestion as a I, I have been guilty in the past of not promoting myself enough and and i can just impress upon you guys to uh you know look at the local databases for the film commissions and put your names on lists and go to events like these yeah volunteer go to film festivals Go to comic cons. There's so many movie people at comic cons these days, and just put your work in front of everybody and get your name out there, you know, and uh, post your your short films or drawings or whatever on Instagram or Tumblr every day, you know. But become like a, a pseudo celebrity of sorts and like gain a found uh, a, a fan base, you know, a following, yeah. And, and uh, do what you did, which was ask for the work, right? Exactly. Exactly. I my first email. I it was a cold email. Like you didn't know me from Adam, but you gave me a chance. I uh, appreciate it. And um, so yeah, that's my advice. Easy enough, right? I second. <laughs> I second all of that. And um, I would add, come hang out with us at Novak. <laughs> um, we uh, we have workshops for adults, 18 and up. They're free. Uh, if you're a resident of East Baton Rouge Parish, we do. Uh, weekend crash courses in different uh, fields in the creative digital media industry. Um, we have a production assistant boot camp coming up where we fly down some uh, production veterans from LA and they lead this boot camp to get you confident and ready and prepared for your first day on set. Um, and we also, if you are not 18 quite yet, we're doing teen filmmaking camps this summer at the libraries that are also free. Clay's teaching some of those as well as another local filmmaker. Um, and so I think just try to learn as much as you can with the resources that are here. There are many. 
um, and try to find a mentor because um, that's a good a good person to have on your team to be giving you advice and to be looking out for opportunities to throw your way. Yes, sir. Great question. Uh, <laughs> our website is novacvideo.org, N-O-V-A-C, video.org. Um, and we have, a, we have an office in New Orleans and an office in Baton Rouge, so we have it split up on the website for the two cities, and, or everything's on our calendar. Um, we also have, we're on all the social medias, um, so we have a general Novak page on Facebook uh, where we post most actively. We also do Twitter and Instagram. Um, and then we also have a Novak Baton Rouge specific Facebook group. Um, so we post about the specific things that we have going on here as well as other community members post about uh, opportunities to help out with projects or to attend events and screenings. Um, we also do a monthly meetup. Um, so uh, the last Tuesday of every month we have a meetup at the parlor and Beauregard Town, which is a lovely space if you haven't been there yet. Um, and so th the goal being to bring creative people from the city together, because for filmmaking, you need all types of artists to come together to do that. So we typically have someone present a project that they're working on. So this Tuesday, the 25th, coming up, um, we have uh, Home Remedy, which is a new web series that some locals are working on. We have some some of the, for the, one of the producers and an actress up there representing um, so, yes, we just have someone local present a project, um, and then we offer free beverages and usually hang out and have a good time afterwards. So, yeah, look out for opportunities like that to meet other folks that are already doing what you want to be doing. And my only advice would be stop procrastinating and to focus on what you love. Pay yourself first with that. Do that first thing in the morning. Write that email. Ask that question, find that mentor, write your story. Because there's a million reasons why you can't get to it today. And that's why you don't get to it today. So that's my advice. I got one more and we're gonna open up the questions. Be, and it's kind of what you said, it's kind of add on what you said, Daniel. Be, you have to be completely obsessed with this. Like it, you have, it's, it's, it, you have to be annoying uh, with, with your passion because if you're not, uh, if you kind of do it on this, if you kind of just mess around with it and, and do something every now and then, you're never going to get traction. You're never going to get that. It's just a hobby. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be your complete passion. I know it's maybe scary to some people, but for me, it was the truth. I think for most people that are successful in this industry, they were just completely obsessed with it. So um, I'll, I'll send a mic up and we'll uh, do a little Q&A real quick. We got like 10 minutes. We, we can we can be here for at least another 10 minutes. I, I want to... Uh, Pass this around. Yeah. Uh, let's give it up for these panelists, yeah. though, guys. We'll take another 10 minutes for audience questions in a round. I'm good with that. And I really love hearing about everyone's passion, because I think that's where we stem from. I, I heard a quote once that was, uh, success is doing what you love doing and being the best at it. So get really good at what you love doing. Where is the first question I can pass the microphone to? Oh, yeah. All right, here we go. Um, I had a question about the financial standpoint because I'm trying to make a film this summer. It's no budget because, you know, I'm a student. So I was trying to figure out what things you can do to build your funds up to have a better produced film. Mm. Mm. If only if you don't. Do you, do you have an answer to that? Well, no, actually, you don't. D don't build up your funds. <laughs> you don't need money. Uh, what, but that's part of what I said about like not eating the elephant is doing something small. Uh, everything that I do that's not budget, because I have, man, I got real good at no budget, right? Um, and like everything that I do that's no budget is no longer than a weekend because I have industry professional friends who are the best at what they do in the state who are like fabulously talented human beings who get paid really good money to do that job I'm asking them to do. Oh, Clay, he's a nice guy. I'll come by for a weekend. You can do a weekend, right? But the second you're doing a week or two weeks or three weeks, you do need to start paying people. And, and, and the, the, the five minute movie that you can make in uh, a weekend is, if you can make an awesome five minute movie, that's more useful to you than making a crappy feature film. You know what I mean? So there are, there are, I mean, getting money is, I have no idea. I have no idea how to get money. I'm so desperate for money. Um, but how to do it without money 
it, I, I find is be really respectful of people's times, keep it super condensed, and you can get awesome people to come help you out if you ask super sweetly. And the only thing I would add is, is um, do a little bit of research and find the vendors that serve the kind of things that you need, whether it's a camera or a light or things like that. And you would be surprised what a phone call will do because you got to remember, they're looking for their future clients and they want to build relationships with filmmakers because that's, you know, that's who keeps them in business. So I back Clay. I would say don't, don't try to go, you know, get money. Just be more resourceful and get things that are more valuable than money. Where's the next question I can take? Yes, sir? I would say, you, you want to follow up with, with money? Because money's a really interesting one. I think that's one of the first rules is try not to use your own money if possible. But uh, we'll always break that rule. Here you go. Yeah. So um, my name is Jackson Pierce. Uh, I don't really have any experience in the film industry. I don't really know a lot about it, but I know that I want to be in it. And it's something that I really want to pursue. Uh, I'm an actor. Um, I do stage in Baton Rouge, uh, primarily musicals and stuff. But I want to make movies. I want to be in movies. Um, and I don't really know where to start. Uh, I've heard a lot about PAing, and everybody said, go for a PA job. It'll, it'll teach you everything you want to know about the industry. And I guess I'm just asking, where do I start with that? Novak, yeah. So um, somebody, I asked a question at uh, the brunch at Celtic Studios, and somebody was like, come here, come sit down. I'm going to tell you all about Novak. And they told me about it, and they gave me all the information. Um, so I guess just start with Novak and then go from there. Or And, and look, let, let me clear some things up. You will not learn everything about filmmaking as a PA. But what you will see is everything going on. So you can start to process and understand how, how things work. But you, you know, there is an incredibly valuable resource here, and you should utilize it, and that's Novak. Novak's fantastic. I am Novak. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I feel like I kind of already gave. Do you have any other specific questions about Novak? Okay. I also think like the, there's other great resources in town, not necessarily for work, but just for meeting people and for watching great films. The Manship plays great films. This film festival, you're in the right place here. Um, the New Orleans Film Festival is also really great if you're open to traveling a little bit. And I think. Between Lafayette, Baton Rouge, and New Orleans, you have a tremendous amount of resources. And so if you can travel and try to be involved in as many things, volunteer at the festivals to meet more people, you know? Um, Definitely become an ambassador to the film festival. Yes, yes. <laughs> we welcome you. Yes. And, and, and I think that with that being said, as a PA, you can see all of the different departments and how they work. Sure. And, and, and when you kind of say, oh, I want to maybe focus in the camera department or in the production department or make a pair of wardrobe, you can kind of determine what it is you, you're truly passionate about. Yes, sir. Here, let me come up with the microphone. Uh, another thing is uh, casting agents, too. Uh, try to get with, you know, to be an extra. You want to be an actor. I mean, uh, there's so many, you know, uh, casting agents around online. I mean, uh, I ended up, I don't want to be an actor, but one day a friend of mine, and that takes snatches a picture of mine from Facebook, throws it to a casting um, agent. I end up getting shot on a movie in Act of Valor. I'm on the trailer. My mother goes to see me in the theater. I'm like, wow, I, I ended up getting, uh, just because of that, it was considered stunts, and now I'm a SAG eligible, just like that. It just, right place at the right time. You know, just, you know, just try everything. I, and I want to just add that real quick. Um, I was kind of in your shoes. I didn't want to be an actor, but I wanted to be a filmmaker. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. So what, what, I, I wrote my own films. I shot my own films. I produced my own films. I directed my own films. And I edited my own films. I did that because I didn't know anybody that could edit or shoot or light or write. So I had to learn those things myself. And when I did, again, like I said, you have to be obsessed with this. So when I was doing that, I, I lived and breathed filmmaking. And that's all I did. So I suggest that to everybody is just get in there, make something that you're passionate about, and completely wear yourself out and then you're going to figure out what you like and what you don't like and you can really focus and and, and kind of pinpoint what you want to master yeah <laughs> yeah but i my friends are from 10 years of pa so that you know you make those friends on set yeah. and be a nice 
be real nice. I think also the 48-hour film festival is yes. really, really good Good way to start. Yep. You learn more in 48 hours about what you don't want to do in film than you'll <laughs> ever learn the rest of your life. That first film I made in 48 hours, um, I, I remember we had a round table and we're all sitting, all my friends were sitting up there arguing about what we're going to make. And I was sitting, I was, I was literally in the fetal position in the corner. <laughs> and at one point someone asked, who's in charge? And everyone goes, well, Sean is. And I'm sitting there like, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. <laughs> so like, it gets better. You know, um, you're going to start low and rise up. So yeah. All right. Next question. Hi, uh, Novak. Can you, can they help also at internship? Um, yes, yeah, so our, the workshops that we offer are part of our workforce training program. So once you take those, you are a NOVAC member and you are eligible for job placement support. Um, w because there have not been as many productions locally, we've branched out to other types of internships with some of the local ad agencies and production companies and news channels here. But if, they're, if you take our classes and I get to know you, I can also work with you to make your resume film friendly so you have a better chance of getting those first jobs, and then anytime something comes to me, the productions now know, like Jason has worked with us to bring on people um, that have been trained through Novak. The productions know to come to us to, to get good, trained, well-trained people. We're gonna take two more questions, one right here. I have a question for Hector. Um, do you still make music today? I do make some music. I don't uh, do. I you know I got out of the the, the rap and, and all that stuff uh, a long time ago. But I still do use my my music talent to do things like scoring some movies, maybe for some uh, uh you know just some scenes and things like that. Sometimes temp music that we I would like to hear some temp music for the scene because I edited and I want it to be a certain thing and I can't find it online. So I I have the talent to at least like you know what let me just make something that I'm feeling. So yes, uh, I still do make music, just not in the in the, the you know. Of the rap and you know r and stuff anymore. Okay. All right. Last question. Yeah, here we go. I have a question. Um, for, well, first I want to say thank you. Uh, my son and I came here. We were actually thinking that the whole thing was to go to film school and then go to California, and and that was the only way that you could get into film. Um, so thank you all for your information and, and for letting us know that other opportunities do exist and uh, we don't have to try to relocate. And I think that's a good thing to cultivate the talent where you are. Uh, but this is for the uh, producer. Um, I wanted to know what are the benefits of being a producer? Do you have to be rich to be a producer? <laughs> and what do you do? <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> I usually look like this. Yeah. Pretty much, this is about 18 hours of my day. Big phone battery. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay, so y there were days when producers made a lot of money. Those days are gone, uh, unfortunately. The distributors tend to be, the big, big distributors are big media companies, and they tend to extract all the profits out of, out of film. So, for the most part, producers like myself, we're, just like everybody else, we, you know, we're just working a job, doing what we're supposed to do. Um, and then producers also develop stories. You know, that's probably, the, you know, for me as a producer, producer, I do two things. First thing is, is I develop a story. Um, and the second thing I do is I'm like the president of the production, right? I run the production. I hire the right people. I get the right gear and things like that. Or I'm at least responsible for that. Um, is an is incredibly difficult job um, because one thing is, is, you know, you're responsible for the money, right? So you have to make sure that you're treating crew fair, you're treating vendors fair, and that treatment is reciprocal, right? Um, like if you have a happy crew, the guy can make, or girl can make a seven minute run to get something off the truck, or that person can make a 15 minute run to get something off the truck, right? And it's really up to them, not up to you. So, um, you know, I, I, I made a comment earlier that it is the only entry level position left in film, and that is a fact, um, other than maybe director. So how do you become a producer? One, either have lots of money, that's a, that's a quick way in, uh, lots of people go that route, 
or have friends with lots of money or be friends with an actor who's worth a lot of money, you know? So that kind of happens. And then the other side would be is to start putting together stories. You don't have to be a writer, but maybe you work with writers or people that want to be writers and you start putting together, you know, stories um, that are compelling, not just to you, but would be compelling to many other people. I, I get lots and lots of submissions for writer, from writers on projects. And, and the thing that I see often is, is that, you know, people tend to write about something that they're passionate about and that's great. But as a producer, what you, what you have to do is you've got to look and you go, it's a business. You got to look and see how many people will want to rent it, buy it, purchase a ticket, things like that. You know, I think that's a downside of, of the creative process because there's so many good things that don't get made. Um, and there's a change right now going on with, you know, companies like Netflix who are able to find these niche audiences and are investing in projects that otherwise would have never, ever, ever, ever been made. Um, but it's the hardest position to define what do you do. Um, and my only answer that I can give you is, is whatever it takes, right? That's what it, that's what it is, whatever it takes. We see producers go to jail all the time, right? And why do they go to jail? Because they did whatever it took <laughs> to get their film made. Um, so you 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 got to re realize there's a line, up that, line that you don't want to you know it. you don't want to cross. Um, but uh, it it is rewarding. Um, everything's like a new startup. Um, there you don't have to be young or old or rich or poor you know you can you can kind of just be driven to get there you just need to educate yourself first you know and go out and like we've been saying about directors go out and produce something find a young person in this room and go let's go and shoot for 2 minutes you know and then you'll you'll start figuring out it's not rocket science you know and the parts that are rocket science well you you'll find the professionals that can do that rocket science you know, so. On, the, on that note, um, if you guys ever watch the Oscars, which I'm hoping you guys do, there's a reason that the winner of Best Picture is accepted by the producer. Um, they're the ones that get it to the finish line, um, whatever it takes, right? Um, but on that note, I think we're out of time. I say we're never out of time, everyone. Let's give it up for this amazing yeah, yeah, panel. Yeah. Thank you let's, guys so much for coming. And let's, let's, make this, let's make this a to be continued experience. I think what's so beneficial about this wonderful industry is that we get to continue to intermingle and ask questions and, and be a voice for the future of this industry and how we make movies and how we, you know, get movies financed and, and also like what stories are being told. I want to see some awesome stories come from this group and from everyone we have here. Let's keep it going for the Louisiana International Film Festival and mentorship program. This is our durability test number two. We're gonna run over this gradical eye with Jens's Jeep. Come over here and take a look. I want you to see the picture. Can you see the picture? Okay, here we go. You see an image in there? That's strong. <laughs>